We are now finally ready to talk about the actual Yonei dilemma. Now, the Yonei dilemma is something that compares the representable functors with random other functors. Well, not completely random other functors, because of course, if we're looking at the representable functor that goes from C op to set, what we're going to do is we're going to consider the situation where we have another functor, a not necessarily representable functor going from C op to set, and a natural transformation there going like that. Now, if if alpha is actually a natural isomorphism, then we say more generally that f is representable as well, although it's not actually one of the representables. But that's not what we're going to talk about here, although if we're lucky, we may talk about that later. We're just going to talk about natural transformations like this, because as it turns out, these are very, very closely controlled. There's very little that they can do, and they're completely controlled by a very small amount of data, which means that well, we can say the innate lemma. And there are often, the situations where we use it are often situations where you think that there's lots going on, where in fact it turns out you have very little choice of what's going on, and everything that's going on everywhere is just controlled by one really small thing. So we'll see what that means in a second. So what's going on here? What it says is that a natural transformation here to here, well, let's see, what's the natural transformation from there to there look like? We're going to consider um, a natural transformation alpha that has as its components, well, it's got to have components that go from h a of x to f of x, okay? And so what's this? This is the common things in C from x to a. And the point is that there's a very special thing inside all of these possible things, which is in the case, if we put x equals a, then we get the whole things from a to a going to f of a. So this is the component a sub alpha. But of course, there is an identity in there. And the idea of this is that the identity goes somewhere where, when it goes to there. And that this actually determines the entire rest of this natural transformation. So once you know where this identity goes, you know where everything else goes. So let's just informally have a look at why that could possibly be true. So supposing we know where this goes. Now we want to know where that goes. So we want to know, we want to now work out what the component at x is that goes to f of x. So what we do is we can start by looking at a naturality square. And now I'm desperately hoping that I've got my naturality square the right way up. We want to know where some morphism f from x to a is going to go. Right. So that's what we want to know. And what we know is we know where the identity goes. So I've declared that once we know where this goes, we know where everything else goes. So we know we know where that goes. So now what's this naturality square going to tell us? Well, we have a morphism coming down here and a morphism coming down here because we're trying to work out where this f goes. So we can, once we're told which f we're trying to consider, we've got an f, right? And it goes from x to a. So this f of f is going to go from f of a to f of x, okay? Because f is a contravariant functor, and this here is going to be pre-composition with f. So now we have a naturality square. What does it tell us? Well, going along, along the, the right-ish, the top right leg, if we start with the identity, it goes over here, and it comes down here to f of f of alpha a 1a, okay? Now, where does it go when we come down here? We come down here, and we compose it with f. So the result of coming down here is, in fact, f, as we want it. And so we know by the naturality of this square that when we go over there, we've got to land in the same place that we first came up with. So look, we know where it is. It's got to be equal to that. So the result is that once we know 
where the identity went. Once we knew where the identity went, we could tell exactly where every single other thing went. So this is not a proof, but this is basically the entire idea of what's going on. Um, of course, I haven't. One of the reasons it's not a proof is because I haven't actually stated what it is we're trying to prove yet. So why don't I do that now? I'll leave that up there for a second and write up what the Yonai dilemma is. That the Yonai dilemma says that there's an isomorphism. So what was it an isomorphism between? Well, what's this? This is just an object in f of a. Okay. So somehow we said that things were completely uniquely determined by some objects in there. And the thing that we started with was a natural transformation from here to here. So we're looking at the totality of natural transformations from H A to F. And what we're saying is that the natural transformations in here precisely correspond to just elements of F of A. I didn't quite say this, but, the, but once you know where this goes, you know where everything goes. But moreover, this identity can go anywhere. Okay, So that means that not only is everything uniquely determined by where it goes, but there is one for every possible place that that identity goes, which tells us that there's a bijection between these two things. Now, of course, in category theory, we don't like to stay with bijections. We like things to be natural isomorphisms. Which, and the naturality says that this isn't just any old bijection, it's a sensible one that was somehow induced canonically by some nice structure. That's what you should think when you think of natural isomorphism. And here it is, this is the canonical way that the thing was induced. It wasn't just some random correspondence between things over here and things over there. It was a really nice one that was induced by composition with something. That's often what the naturality is saying. So what this is, is it's a natural isomorphism between here and here, natural, natural in what? It's natural in everything it could be natural in. It's natural in both the object A and F. So it's natural in A, so this is as an object of C, and it's natural in F as an object, object of C offset. That's probably an op up there. So, to recap again, it's saying that any natural transformation in here is completely determined by an object in here in a really nice way. So what we'll do next time is we'll actually completely prove it. It's a nice exercise, if you like that kind of thing, in cat pure diagram chasing category theory. You should be able to go home and do it yourself now. So perhaps in between watching this and the next video, you can go home and do it yourself.